In the last decade, there truly has been an explosion in electric vehicles in the marketplace. Higher end models like the Tesla Model S Dual Motor Performance and Porsche Taycan Turbo S offer performance and specifications that actually exceed that of many internal combustion engine models in the same segment. Meanwhile, more modestly priced cars like the MG ZS EV, the Nissan Leaf, the Renault Zoe, the Volkswagen E-Up and the Hyundai Ioniq, to name a few, are coming in at the other end of the market, offering ownership price parity with internal combustion engine vehicles in regions where fossil fuels are heavily taxed. In short, it has never been more easy or more affordable to find an electric car that suits your needs. And while there are still some significant steps to be made in order to make electric vehicles truly affordable for everyone, you probably already know my feelings on this subject, electric cars are now capable of fulfilling the role of primary car or sole car in most households. And while they should definitely be cheaper, they are now more affordable than they once were. That's in a large part down to economies of scale bringing the prices down, battery pack improvements making batteries more energy dense and longer lasting, and of course improvements in rapid charging in the form of DC quick charging capabilities, both in terms of available infrastructure outside the home as well as on vehicle charging capabilities. With the Apple TV premiere of Long Way Up, where Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman ride from the tip of South America to Los Angeles on electric motorcycles, and with plenty of keen motorcyclist friends showing interest in this, I've been pondering why electric motorcycles haven't progressed quite as quickly as they have in the electric car world. Electric motorcycles, and I'm talking about motorway capable speed limit exceeding steeds, capable of giving internal combustion engined bikes a true run for their money, as well as lesser powered ones with more modest capabilities but decent charging capabilities, are still for the most part out of the reach of most people. And by out of reach, I mean that they are either so expensive that you might as well buy an electric car, or they're so underpowered that they're not a real substitute for a similarly priced internal combustion engine model. So why is that? And what's happening in the electric motorcycle world to tackle those challenges? If you want the quick take and you fancy hitting the stop button in about 30 seconds, here's my short answer. Batteries, economies of scale and aerodynamics. Before I delve into explaining the engineering challenges that make building ice-beating electric motorcycles much harder than electric cars, I should acknowledge at this point that if you're on the lookout for a budget around town scooter or motorcycle that maxes out at somewhere between 30 and 50 miles per hour or has a sub 100 mile range and slow overnight charging, then there are some great and not so great options now available to you. The Super Soco TC Max, as well as Vespa's Electrica electric scooter, in addition to many Chinese imported scooters which may or may not have decent performance and life, all come to mind. But for now, let's focus on the meat of the matter, why electric motorcycles aren't where electric cars are developmentally. At the end of the day, it all comes down to one very simple thing, space. Modern electric cars are as good as they are because they have plenty of onboard space dedicated to a large battery pack under the vehicle floor or sometimes even integrated into its chassis. They also have space for a nice big radiator and a cooling loop to keep the battery pack cool and happy. And then they have powerful onboard chargers thanks to all of that extra space or DC charging circuitry for rapid high power charging. Motorcycles? Not so much. Everything has to be pretty much squeezed into the frame where the internal combustion engine would be on a legacy motorcycle. And while there is no need for gears on an electric motorcycle, which technically frees up more space and allows some nifty games of Tetris to be played in order to make sure everything fits as it should, there's still not an awful lot of space that's spare. This not only limits the physical amount of batteries you can squeeze in, but it also makes designing liquid cooling systems for the motor, the battery pack and power electronics pretty darned tough. Which in turn makes the managing of the heat produced by long periods of high power demands needed for the performance people expect from a motorcycle a really complicated engineering puzzle. It's not impossible, but it is pretty tough. 
That lack of physical space in the chassis isn't the only problem though. Weight is also an issue. The more batteries you put in to try and expand your range, the heavier the bike becomes. And while there are electric motorcycles that seem to break the laws of physics in that regard, the zero range of electric motorcycles manage to stay relatively lightweight while packing a decent range per charge, the majority of electric motorcycles out there struggle to keep the weight down whilst offering decent range, performance and charging. You may not feel that weight while the bike is moving, but you will most definitely feel it when you're putting it on and off the stand or doing some kind of low speed manual manoeuvring. At this point, I should probably acknowledge that heavy bikes aren't a new thing in the motorcycle world. But while large engine heavy motorcycles are one thing, that extra weight is normally accompanied by a lot of extra power. Those batteries in an electric motorcycle add extra weight, giving you more range, but not necessarily the grin factor. The Energica SASA9, a bike I truly fell in love with last year, tips the scales at more than 600 pounds, which is far more than most Street Fighter or Naked bikes powered by an internal combustion engine. It was fast, it was sexy, but boy did you know how heavy it was when you parked it up. And yes, I did drop it. But increasing battery pack sizes also provides a different challenge to electric motorcycle companies, how to charge them quickly and efficiently. Most modern electric motorcycles thankfully have onboard charging and most also have some way to charge at a public charging station. But when it comes to quick charging, the physical size of the battery pack and how it's built can impact charge times. That's because electric motorcycle battery packs tend to be smaller in capacity and have more basic thermal management than their counterparts in electric cars and thus they have to be more conservative about charging rates to prevent overheating, which would cause premature battery aging, or worse. It's not just DC quick charging either. Zero doesn't even offer DC quick charging on any of its bikes, but it does allow customers to add extra AC modules to improve AC charging. Even then though, it doesn't warranty stupidly fast recharge times because of the potential of battery cell damage and battery overheating. And then you've got the question of range, or why electric motorcycles seem to have poor ranges. The answer there is simple, batteries do pay a part, it's always connected to batteries. But then you, as a rather unaerodynamic human, is sitting atop of the motorcycle, which instantly causes the efficiency to go through the floor. Yeah, we humans are the main reason why electric motorcycles have poor ranges, because it's much harder to get a motorcycle with a big human on top aerodynamic than it is a fully enclosed car. If those problems weren't enough, there is another problem. Unlike electric cars, which tend to be used fairly regularly, especially if you own just one, electric motorcycles may go through long periods of inactivity, just like internal combustion engine bikes. Winter riding is usually for the strongest of souls, and that can mean your electric motorcycle may end up laid up for months at a time. That in of itself is hard on the battery pack, and companies bringing electric motorcycles to market that have a plug must be ready to deal with that hurdle in addition to all of the others I've mentioned. I hear people regularly discuss how frustrating it is that all the good electric motorcycles, the Harley-Davidson Livewire, the various Zeros and Energica models, to mention but a few, are super expensive. Expensive in some cases to beyond the sticker price of an entry-level electric car. There are, of course, multitudes of reasons for this, but usually, like the electric cars of a decade ago, it does boil down to economies of scale and the need to recoup development costs. Batteries are the most expensive thing in any electric vehicle, and electric motorcycles are no exception, especially if you end up using battery cells that are resistant to extremes of temperature, do not require active liquid cooling, have a long lifespan, and are small enough that they can be built into the shape that's needed for an electric motorcycle pack. So what are the future? Well, it does depend on how far battery and motor technology progresses, as well as how many motorcycle companies make the switch to electric. Electric does seem inevitable, but frankly, I think it's going to be a long time before we see an electric motorcycle with 250 miles of highway range, rapid charging, and a price tag that's closer to its internal combustion engine counterparts. I really hope I'm proven wrong. 
That's it for today's video. As always, thanks to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month patrons. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, John Lyons, Ray Jean Fellows, and Jeffrey Songster, and our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters. That's Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, and Sean Udea. You can join any of these Patreon supporters yourself just by following the link below or you'll find links to make a donation through Ko-fi or Bitcoin. You'll also find a link to our free Discord server, so sign in and come and chat with everybody in the Discord chat rooms. After the names have scrolled, you'll see a suggestion for a new video from this channel, so please consider watching it if you haven't, and I'll be back very soon. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving.